The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Imagine trying to comply with stay-at-home orders when you don't really have a home. For people in Ontario experiencing homelessness, that's been a defining problem throughout this crisis. Tonight, we'll hear how several communities are trying to help. First up, Nam Kiwanuka finds out why Ontario's financial accountability officer says this province's current plans won't meet the dire need for more housing. It's Thursday, March 25th, and that's tonight on The Agenda. Ontario's housing programs will not keep pace with demand. That was the top line takeaway from a report earlier this month from the Financial Accountability Office of Ontario. With us to drill down on those findings, Peter Waltman, who is Ontario's Financial Accountability Officer, is joining us from Ottawa. Hi. Hi. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Nice to be on. Um, so when you set out to do this report, what did the Financial Accountability Office set out to find? It was a report that was requested from us by an MPP. So one thing that's important to remember is that members of parliament, provincial parliament can ask us to undertake work within our mandate, and this was one of those. And it was a request that came in towards uh, just after you know, what's fall of 2018, <clears throat> after the national housing strategy was signed between the province and the federal government. And the request was, so we have a new housing strategy. What does this mean? So it's a fairly broad question to answer. And what we did was we went about answering it by looking at the difference between the new strategy, which started in 2018 and went to 2028, 29, and saw what would the outcomes would be at the end of that strategy compared to what the previous 10 years looked like. And what did you find? So we found that, uh, generally speaking, the although the, the amount of money is going to increase somewhat, it's going to be, on, on average, about the same as it was over the last 10 years. We're going to see some dips. And uh, because we had a period of, grow of, of spending growth uh, with programs that were funded partly through the cap and trade program, which, were, which was canceled. So overall spending has basically in this new program replaced expiring agreements from previous programs. So that was one. Mm -hmm. um, two is, the number of households that were going to receive additional support or additional households that receive report, we're going to see more people actually being able to receive re uh, support due to the construction of the types of programs. Uh, but three was, at the end of the day, we will still have more households in core housing need, i.e. households looking for affordable housing than we had at the start of the program. You know, governments change, and when governments change, uh, so do their mandates. Um, so when you look back, uh, how has the province's housing and homelessness, homelessness programs changed over time? So what's, uh, what, what you have here is uh, different <clears throat> types of... Let's, let's go back to the beginning. So really you have two on, on the housing side, and the report breaks this out nicely. The, the, the report's quite large. It actually covers affordable housing and homelessness. So on the affordable housing side, you have two real types of, of housing. You have social housing, which was started up in the 40s, and those were units built uh, by either by contractors or by governments. Uh, and those are units available to households who uh, it's, they're called rent to income. So basically, they pay a certain percentage of rent, uh, or rent as a percentage of their income, and they're in about 30%, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, you have an affordable housing piece, which are effectively subsidized rent. So builders who will build units and offer them at 80% of market rate. And there's a third piece, which is the Canada Ontario Housing Benefit, which is a, a subsidy that follows the family. Um, and it can either you be used to supplement rent if you're in a, an affordable housing unit that's still too expensive, or if you're in a unit and your income drops and you're at risk of becoming homeless. So that is a little more flexible program, and that's the one that's going to reach a few more people than in the previous 10 years. So when we talk about people who are experiencing homelessness, how does the uh, provincial government measure that number? 
Well, that's a good question because that's what we found in the report. The provincial government, this previous government and this government here have both made a commitment to end chronic homelessness by 2025. Um, we're not going to, we're not seeing that happen without some different policy measures. Uh, the province at the moment doesn't measure how many people or the number of people that are homeless. Um, so how can they know who needs help? Well, precisely. They, 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 that, that's that, and that it's not as simple as it sounds. It's difficult to measure homelessness and certainly chronic homelessness. Uh, folks are finding shelter wherever they can and maybe in different places at different times. So it's not always e it's easy to pin people down and count them. Uh, the government just released something, I think it was last week or the week before, a new protocol uh, instructing municipalities as to how to come up with a different way to count homelessness. But clearly, if you're trying to end chronic homelessness, and we estimated in the report about 16,000 families every night find themselves homeless in Ontario. So if you're going to eliminate that, you obviously need to know what your population is first and what some of the key drivers are as to what's creating the homelessness. And what we found in the report was homelessness is often created either by escaping from abusive family situations or if there's an addiction issue going on. Uh, so those are two key factors you need to be able to start to end homelessness. Because uh, even if you are experiencing homelessness, different communities have different needs, correct? Well, that's that's precisely right. Now, we didn't get into that in the report, uh, but we but I think it's important to keep in mind that, you know, folks living in Toronto and Vancouver, which which will I guess we'll get to in a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, you have expensive housing. So there's going to be a harder time for folks to find affordable housing. But there's also homelessness in rural areas and they're harder to count because they're, they're, they're in some respects they are hidden. I think if you talk to folks in those areas, they'll tell you that it's a much more prevalent problem than people will will think to you know to acknowledge because they're not sitting out in the you know they're not camped out under a bridge somewhere like you might see in Toronto. Uh, you mentioned the national housing strategy. Uh, what is that? The national housing strategy is a 10-year federal provincial program and it's a four billion dollar program over that 10-year period uh, funded two-thirds by the federal government one-third by the provincial government and it's to provide funds to as I said, to try to alleviate uh, homelessness and to provide more access to affordable housing for families that need it. So under that strategy, um, what does it commit the, fed the federal government and the provincial government uh, to do? So the government, well, the, the Ontario government who is delivering this program uh, has said that it was hoping to be able to reach more families in need than they were under previous programs. And we found that an additional over the 10 years, oh, sorry, by the end of 2027, 28, 55,300 households, more households will receive uh, support compared to 2018, 19. But the other corollary to that is while they will receive support, it won't be enough support to bring them out of core housing need. There will still, there will still be about 80,500 additional households in core housing need by 2027, 28. I think you have to remember too, as the population grows, the population of folks who need affordable housing grows, as the cost of housing starts to get crazier, I mean, it's been crazy for a while, getting crazier, it's harder and harder for folks to afford affordable housing if they are in a low income situation. So that population will continue to grow regardless, you know, if, even if you're increasing the funding, you have to increase, if you're trying to make a, you know, you're trying to keep it level, you're still going to have to increase to account for that additional population growth. Um, but so there is a little bit of good news because some people will be taken out of um, precarious situations, correct? Yes, some people will be taken out of precarious situations. And then we have something called critical housing need where you are effectively spending 50% or more of your, of your gross family income on housing and you are earning uh, a salary at what is basically described as the poverty level. So that, that Canada Ontario housing benefit is more targeted to folks like that to help them either get out of homelessness, but more, more readily to try to stay in the home they currently have. So if the home is becoming more unaffordable, either through an income problem on the family side or maybe a rent you know, rents have gone up on their side. So there's an additional benefit or this new benefit that is able to target those folks and help them stay where they are, which we which we see. That, that's the big difference, I think it's fair to say, between the old program and the new national housing strategy. And what about municipalities? What role do they play in these programs? 
So municipalities play a huge role because they effectively deliver the social housing program. So they own and maintain the stock of social housing. They may not own it, but they are they are charged with with maintaining that, with with um, screening folks to have to manage the wait list and get them in, make sure those units are are livable. Um, they also help in the front end with screening folks and helping families who need help to get the help they need. So municipalities have a very, very large role in, uh, in affordable housing. Uh, so let's talk more about housing. Um, how do these programs assess which households are eligible to receive support? So there are many different assessments, but the one that we focus on in our report is what we call core housing. Well, no, we call what the CMHC calls core housing need. Mm -hmm. So a family in core housing need is a family whose lodging costs, whether it be rent or mortgage or combination thereof, are in excess of 30% of their gross household income and or the house, the lodging they live in is not big enough to accommodate the family <clears throat> and or the house they live in, the accommodation they live in is not in sufficient state of good repair to permit them to live there. So it's in need of major repairs. So if anybody finds themselves in those situations, they are considered to be in core housing need. And what we'll see with this program is while it will make a bit of a dent on the absolute terms, the core housing need will still grow. And by the end of 2027, 28, 735,000 families in Ontario will find themselves, <clears throat> excuse me, in core housing need. Um, and do you think the pandemic might make that number higher? We, our report didn't take into account the pandemic. There was uh, a lot of additional spending that happened, certainly in the in the homelessness area, to help people who were in shelters to be able to spread out or to relocate them to areas so they wouldn't be quite as as uh, as con well contagious isn't the right word, but as readily able to spread the disease. So there was a lot of a time and effort and money spent there. But that is a one off, and that is not part of part of our analysis. Maybe the pandemic will will surface the uh, the situation more broadly. Maybe more people would become uh, cognizant of of the homelessness and and lack of affordable housing situation because it was a fairly visible part of the. Those were folks who were pretty badly affected by the pandemic, and and I think that might be brought to bear a little more than maybe it had, would have had in the in. You know, in normal times. Um, we have a graphic here for, that you provided for us. Uh, Sheldon, if you could please uh, bring this up. And it's showing the percentage of households in core housing need in Canada uh, and the provinces. So we're looking at percentage of households versus the provinces. On one end, let's start with New Brunswick at 7.3%, Quebec 75 Newfoundland and Labrador at 8.4%, uh, Prince Edward Island at 8.6%, Alberta 108 uh, Nova Scotia 11 11.4. For the whole uh, Canada, the average in Canada is 11.6. In Manitoba, 11.7. Saskatchewan, 11.7. And in Ontario, on the other side of the graphic, 13.9. Uh, and British Columbia at 14.6. Uh, Peter, can you explain at what where it is that we're looking at right now? Yeah, so again, these are households in core housing need as a percentage of the households of the province. As I described earlier, by the end of the program piece, it'll be 735,000 households. So 13.9% of all households in Ontario are in core housing need. So they either, they don't have enough income to pay rent by 30% of their income, or they're in a house that isn't suitable, and they're in a house that isn't suitable, whether it needs repairs or whether it's just not big enough. Um, so... I think what's interesting with this graph is that BC and Ontario are well above the national average. And it's not that difficult to figure out why, because Vancouver and Toronto are the two most expensive cities in which to live in this country by a long shot. Mm -hmm. So if you're somebody who hasn't got a lot of income and is looking for a place they can afford to live, uh, it's going to be, you know, not only going to be hard to find something, but even if you're part of the program that provides an, a, a subsidy, like a 20% rent subsidy, rents are still so high, uh, in many cases, they're out of reach of folks who, who would even be part of the program. Um, I should mention that your office doesn't uh, make policy or give advice. Um, but, you know, when you do look at those numbers, they're really concerning. Will the national housing strategy be enough to reduce the number of households in core housing need? Well, that's, a, you know, that's the crux of the matter. So 
and I think that's where maybe your panel that's following will be able to discuss in more detail. We can't get into the policy imperatives and the pros and the cons, but what we do is we provide the baseline. Here's what here's what the program is, here's what's being spent, and here's what the outcome is going to be at the end of this program. And as I said before, the outcome will be, although more folks will have a chance of getting some assistance than they would have in the old program, we're still going to see more people in core housing need at the end of the program than at the beginning of the program. Now, if your objective as a government is to basically say, we want to have more people getting support, well, this program will do that. 55,000 additional households will receive support under this program compared to the last one. If your objective is to get everybody out of core housing need, this program will not achieve that. Mm. Well, something else that we should talk about is the affordability gap. What is that? So that's a calculation that we did, and uh, just to try to give people a sense as to the costs to the program of getting somebody of, of subsidizing folks who are who are getting uh, either the affordable housing or the social housing or the housing sub, housing benefit, which might include a rent subsidy. So on average, folks who are in social housing or rent geared to income housing who are by definition no longer in core housing need because their rent is geared to their income. The subsidy, those families are receiving a subsidy roughly $6,300 per year. So that's roughly what it costs to bring those folks into rent geared to income. Households who are in below market rent situations, so they're paying 80% of the market rent as an example, they're getting a, a subsidy of roughly $3,800. So, and as I said before, that doesn't necessarily bring them out of core housing need if they're living in very expensive accommodation because they happen to be living in a very expensive city. And there's a final piece here. Rent supp supplements provide households with about $4,500. So on average, what we call is the core affordability gap is about $4,000. So that's roughly the level of support that the government provides to folks who are in the program to, 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 give, them, to give them some assistance. With that being said, um, to what extent do these programs uh, address the affordability gap? Well, I think that's a, a, that, that so goes back to so, to the subsidy. So if the affordability gap is four thousand dollars. If you are a family receiving uh, housing or rent to geared income housing, the subsidy you're getting is roughly sixty three hundred. So you're well into you know you're, it's a, you're there. You've got your affordable housing. You can live in. It's geared to income. It's costing governments around 6,300 a year. If you're somebody, if you're getting rent supplements, it's costing governments 4,500 a year. So for the most part, you're there also. And this is on average. Not every family is going to be in this situation. It's on average, and that's important. Mm -hmm. If you're living in affordable housing where your rent is subsidized, in many, on average, you're not there. You're still paying more than you can afford, you know, notionally for the house that you're in, even though you're getting some help through a rent supplement. So you're not. It's maybe not as unaffordable as it was. It's still considered to be unaffordable. Um, based on your analysis, um, are any of these programs working at getting people into homes that they can afford? Well, sure. I mean, they pro all of the programs do work in getting people into the homes they can afford. I think the, the point is that, um, uh, you know, so... The, are they working well enough? That's always, you know, going to be up for debate. So while we're going to see over 10 years, 50, 55,300 households are additional households are going to receive the support that they need to get themselves into some level of affordable housing. But, you know, still half of those folks are still going to be in housing they can't quite afford. There's just going to be more affordable than it was before. Mm -hmm. So, yes, more folks will benefit. Will they benefit enough to pull them out of core housing need? No. Uh, and in your view, I know you can't give uh, policy or advice, but obviously all of these things, all these numbers do um, are all interconnected with the province's finances. Um, why, why is it important for us to um, get a handle on people who are experiencing homelessness and to actually track those numbers? It's really important uh, because there are certainly are economic impacts to having folks who are homeless. And while our report doesn't go into those, there are many folks who do a lot of their research and spend a lot of their time talking about that sort of thing. <clears throat> but folks who may have uh, other medical issues or family issues that have forced them to into, into let's say, shelters, um, you know, there are costs being incurred to support them, both on the social support side, on the education side, on the medical side. And, uh, 
you know, home having a home gives a level of stability. There's lots of research there to show that if you have a place you can live, then it becomes a little bit easier to manage your way through the world. So they all do have long-term economic impacts. And if you have a lot of folks that need a lot of, you know, social support, that that does that does have a, a, you know, a cost to the government. Peter Weldman, thank you so much for your insights. We appreciate you making time for us this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have thanks for having me on. From tent cities in urban downtowns to shelters and ad hoc efforts to house people during this year of COVID-19, staying home to stay safe simply hasn't been available to people in this province who are facing homelessness. With us now on what trying to move the yardsticks to help vulnerable people during a crisis has been like, four experts working to help house people. So let's welcome, in Thunder Bay, Ontario, Rebecca Schiff, Associate Professor and Chair in the Department of Health Sciences at Lakehead University and the co-lead of the project At Home in the North. In Windsor, Ontario, Reverend Ron Dunn, Executive Director of the Downtown Mission of Windsor. In Kitchener, Ontario, Nadine Green, Site Coordinator of A Better Tent City. And in the downtown core of the provincial capital, Lorraine Lamb, an outreach worker at Sanctuary Toronto, who's got the best Twitter handle of anybody I've seen. Lorraine, what's your Twitter handle? Lorraine Lamb Chop. That is perfect. I love that. That is great. Uh, I want to thank all four of you for joining us tonight on TVO. I know you all just saw the interview that Peter Weltman, the FAO, did. And uh, why don't we just start there? Rebecca, have you got anything you want to react to from that interview? Yeah, thanks, Steve. So I'll just point out two things. I think um, the the first one that that I uh, the the first thing that caught me was that it's very focused on sort of uh, I guess financial aspects, and of course this is coming from the financial accountability officer. So we're talking about affordability and very much in a monetary sense and how to lift people out of homelessness by providing more affordable housing. But I think one of the major issues that was missed is that there are a wide range of other supports that people need. And so just providing housing isn't always enough. It certainly is core to making sure that uh, that people can be safely and adequately housed. But there are a lot of other needs as well. And so I didn't really see any anything that uh, the, the accountability officer addressed um, in that regard or that his report addressed. The other thing that I draw attention to is just the methodologies for accounting for counting uh, the number of homeless people. And so he had mentioned that the province had just mandated that all of the uh, municipalities and regions in the province can't now count uh, homeless people using a new methodology. It's not really a new methodology that they're mandating and, and it's a somewhat flawed methodology. So I think that there uh, needs to be a bit more thought into um, the way that we count um, who is homeless and, and where people homeless, uh, homeless people are living. Okay, we get those comments on the record. Nadine Green, what would you add to that? Um, I, I, I just wanted to add about the numbers and how we the government needs to get help from outside people or people from this panel. And it was, it was just enlightening hearing everything that he said. Okay, I think we're about to do that over the next half hour. Uh, Reverend Dunn, what would you say? You know, the takeaways for me were um, were anger, to be honest, from the report. Um, it was very well done. Uh, my anger is not pointing at anybody, but the system itself. The headline on the on the uh, document was falling short on housing and homelessness. Um, after 10 years, we're going to be no further ahead than we are today, um, and that's the plan. I don't think, as Canadians, you know, living in the greatest country in the world, that we should accept a plan that's anything less than a move forward. Um, and that that's my kind of my opening comments for, for that report. Okay. Lorraine, anything to add from downtown Toronto? I would say that, um, I mean, even the report emphasizes that it's not enough. I know in Toronto we're seeing 600 new people enter the shelter system. So this status quo is clearly not working. And I think it's important to name that even the report says that they don't take COVID into account. And we know that so many people have lost jobs over this pandemic season. And so the numbers of people who actually need better supports are going to rise. And the plan right now is hardly a plan. All right, we should just remind everybody for what it's worth that, that Peter Weltman, the financial accountability officer, did this report in response to a request from a member of the Ontario legislature who asked that he look into the issue. Um, so again, we just put that on the record as a means of 
understanding how this thing came to be in the first place. Let's, speaking of understanding, understand better what it is that you folks do. Nadine, why don't you start us off? A Better Tent City in Kitchener, what's your mission? So I'm the site, um, the site coordinator of A Better Tent City, Tiny tiny Homes. I take care of the day-to-day -day op the day -to -day oper operation, sorry. And how many people here, do you serve? We have 50 people here at the moment. 50 people that, that is working with your organization or that you are serving? 50, 50 people that I'm serving, people that, that are homeless and hard, that were hard to house. And they're all living here, living well. And um, I make sure everything go okay. Um, I make sure everything is okay. I, I break up fights. I give orders for jobs. Like people do their own jobs here, doing the cleaning, taking care of stuff like that. Understood. Ron Dunn, tell us about your organization. Sure. We are the United Church of Canada Downtown Mission. Um, so we've been here since 1972. All of our programs and services, there's about a dozen from youth services. We run the, the largest uh, shelter in our area, 103 beds, um, food recovery, food services, job reintegration, anything that has to do with helping people lift themselves out of poverty. And, uh, and certainly emergency shelter is, is a big part of what we do every day. 103 beds, how often are they full? Sadly, too often. Um, COVID has changed some things, of course, but the other number, you know, we do about 910 meals a day, uh, hot meals for people in our community. So uh, we rescue 1.5 million pounds of produce a year and redistribute it from the county into the city. It's, it's a, as an unfunded agency, it's quite a, quite a challenge, but um, one that we, we do from a faith faith-based lens. Lorraine, Sanctuary Toronto does what? We are a community downtown Toronto um, that exists to really be um, a space where people who are on the margins of our society are most valued and centered. Um, and we often want to highlight that people who are on the margins are there because of larger systems that intersect to keep people in that space. And I think it's important to name, you know, earlier, Steve, you said that it's important to have experts around the room to talk about this. And I need to say that the experts on the housing reality and the homelessness crisis are the people who are on the streets right now who mm -hmm. are not sitting in front of the Zoom camera right now speaking to you. I hear you. And how many people do you serve? Uh, I would say that during COVID, we've definitely seen an increase of people coming to access food and support. I would say every meal we're serving, we have about 300 to 400 meals that we're serving every day. Hmm. And you, w with a staff of how many people? We are a small little crew of about 18 people. Small but mighty. Yeah, we try. <laughs> I betcha. Rebecca Schiff, tell us about At Home in the North. At home in the north. So when the National Housing Strategy was launched uh, a few years ago, uh, Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, or CMHC, partnered with one of the federal uh, research funding agencies called SHRC, or the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, to fund uh, large partnerships that bring together researchers, organizations, people with lived experience of homelessness and, and, and housing issues to work on the priorities of the National Housing Strategy. So there are several priorities in the National Housing Strategy, and there are a few different of these partnership grants or partnership research projects that were funded. And At Home in the North is one of them, and it addresses northern housing and homelessness as a priority under the northern housing strategy. So I co-lead that um, with colleagues at Memorial University, uh, McGill University, and Ryerson. Uh, and we're we're interested in learning about solutions and how to end homelessness in, in northern Canada. With that background now in place, oh, you know what, just before I do that, it's interesting that you said in northern Canada, because my hunch is there is an impression out there that people think homelessness is a big city urban problem and maybe not much of a problem anywhere else. Would you care, Rebecca, to dispel that notion? Yes, I, I would very much so. Uh, homelessness is a huge issue in, in northern communities, in rural communities. I work a lot with the National Alliance to End Rural and Remote Homelessness as well, which is part of the larger Canadian Alliance to End homelessness. And what we're finding through some of our recent research is that in many rural areas in small cities like Thunder Bay, the rates of homelessness are actually double what they are or double or more what they are in big cities. So for example, in Thunder Bay, the homelessness rate, uh, uh, the percentage of people are, who are homeless is double what it is in Toronto or Calgary and quadruple what it is in Vancouver. So homelessness is very much an issue in rural and northern Canada. And how many clients would you be dealing with with 
with at home in the north? We're, we're not dealing specifically with clients, so we work with the organizations that work with uh, people who are experiencing homelessness and housing insecurity, and so I would estimate that that represents thousands, tens of thousands of people. Tens of thousands in the north. Yes. Okay, well, that leads us to our next line of questioning, which is everybody in this country knows that homelessness has been an intractable, intractable problem for decades and decades. And now we've just had COVID-19 dumped on top of it to boot. So, Lorraine, start us off, if you would. What has COVID-19 done to the homelessness issue that you were already dealing with? I think COVID has actually shone a light on the shadows where our governments and policies have tried to hit homeless people. Um, it's been clear during the pandemic that um, resources were hardly sufficient before the pandemic. And now this pandemic has really shown that these gaps have just been exacerbated. I think COVID comes at a time when the homelessness reality was in a state of emergency, as is the poison drug reality. So now we're living in this reality of like the triple threat of pandemics and people are literally dying just trying to, to get housing somewhere. Nadine, do you notice that there is more homelessness and harder to serve homeless people because of this pandemic? Yes, there is. And because of the pandemic, I guess there's more help for the people. They put them up in hotels and everything like that. And you, do you, I guess you appreciate the fact that the governments have been prepared to do something on that? Yes, I am, very much. But I presume there's going to be a time when putting up homeless people in hotels is no longer going to be an option. What then? That's why they need to come up with more tiny homes community like what Ron Doyle did, and that will help. Tell me what you mean when you say tiny homes. I heard you say that before, and I should have followed up then, but I'm going to follow up now. Well, at the at where I am at the Lot 42 and Better 10 City, it's a tiny home community with tiny homes. We have 20, 26 homes here at the moment. And what's a tiny home? It's an 8 by 10. It's kind of like a shed, but it's a tiny home, and that's... That is what we're doing here to house the homeless people. How many square feet would it be? Uh, it's about eight by ten. <laughs> so you're not kidding. It's tiny. And I live in one of them. Does it get the job done, though? Yes, it does. It keeps you warm. It's just a safe place for you to be in. And you have your own key, and it's like it's home. Okay. Uh, Reverend Dunn, how about you? Talk to us about whether or not COVID has made homelessness in southwestern Ontario look and feel different. Well, I'll, I'll echo, echo the statements made uh, out of Toronto. Um, what's happened is that I think all levels of government have, they knew about homelessness, but now it's it's much more prevalent. There's a light been, been shone on it, or the, the veil's been lifted, as it were. At one point um, during the first um, shutdown here in, in Windsor-Essex, we were the only kind of game in town in terms of, you know, it was like a little bit of a, I was expecting tumbleweeds to go through past my window here. Um, people experiencing homelessness really had nowhere to go outside of of uh, a couple of, of shelters here locally. So um, I, I think and I hope that we've learned some things from this, that it doesn't go away when, when we deem that the pandemic has been uh, tackled, and, and I hope that we'll be able to say that someday. Um, things like tiny homes, for example, in Kitchener-Waterloo, I think everyone's been looking at that project. Um, it takes political will. It takes um, government to say, okay, we know about zoning bylaws, but we're gonna we're gonna help push these things through um, because they're necessary. We have been trying to build a new facility for the last couple of years. It's very difficult, and um, I think that this pandemic has has opened up the eyes of people who say, look, there's a lot more homelessness, either hidden or or visual, than we first anticipated. Now, were you not ordered to shut down by the provincial state of emergency? I was. Um, so we we became an outbreak, um, 23 or 24 of my staff and uh, about 60 or 70 guests were affected with uh, with COVID-19. So we were ordered to shut down. We voluntarily left our buildings and went to a, um, a larger facility where we felt we could control social distancing a little better. Um, and so, yeah, we, we've had our, our series of challenges with uh, with local government, quite frankly, and uh, and just trying to, to navigate the pandemic um, in a world, you know, we certainly weren't prepared for it. Now, when you were ordered to shut down, did you at any point disobey the law and reopen anyway? 
Well, uh, I'm sure if my lawyer was sitting to me, he'd say <laughs> for me to say no. But you know, the truth is this: um, we did reopen um, what was deemed as a rogue shelter. The system that we created, we helped create, was we moved everybody to a, a city uh, facility. Um, it left a gap in service. And the mission's role has always been to fill gaps. So I'm always going to respond by saying that whatever's in the best interest of those I serve, I will do. And so for a period of about a week, I did operate uh, what would, would have been considered an illegal shelter. Um, but there was 36 people, 35 people that needed a place to go. Um, some of them, when when the closure happened to us, had nowhere to go. Um, they weren't being accepted in in a timely fashion. So I pushed for, you know, emergency shelter in real time, and and we got that. You know, it was really just a communication gap. I I hope um, nobody obviously would do anything malice to to our our population. So it really was just kind of figuring out those gaps and and closing them up. And so, yeah, I, I ran against the law for a little bit. I get you. You you are a rogue after all. But um, and 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 you plead guilty to that. I can see that. You don't mind being called <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah. I wear it with pride, actually. There you go. But I guess I wonder. You know, it's, you're running a congregate setting. So did anybody catch COVID as a result of those actions? Yeah. Well, I don't know if they caught COVID, but there were certainly more cases identified. My argument is that if we had not done that those folks would have been on the street in contact with even more people. So um, eight more people came out of our, our temporary shelter, or the rogue shelter, if you will, um, with having been found positive. But I would argue that they probably were positive going in. Um, at the end of the day, and I, I don't know if our other panelists will, will agree, COVID is one element of what might affect or does affect those living uh, rough or, or experiencing homelessness. Um, have to deal with. And and so in some ways, it was not the most important aspect of of their day, if that makes sense. I saw people nodding their heads while you were saying that. So yes, I hear you. Uh, Rebecca, I want to go to you next because you, I guess when we had the H1N1 issue some years back, you studied homelessness at that time. What were the lessons that you might have learned on that occasion that could be applied to where we're at today? So... <laughs> One of the things we learned, Steve, was first of all, that most cities uh, in Canada did not have pandemic preparedness plans that included homeless people as a vulnerable population. And we also know that homeless people um, and people who are sleeping rough and are housing insecure are incredibly vulnerable to infectious disease. And and they're, they're just a, a range of, of concerns that, that arise when, when there's infectious disease or, or a pandemic like we're experiencing now. So we what we identified from that research was one that homeless people needed to be considered part of the vulnerable populations that should be addressed first and should have special consideration during pandemic events and also that there needed to be more support for municipalities and regions to create pandemic plans that could respond to the needs of the homeless sector. And so we saw some of that research taken up by the federal government. So in Health Canada's um, pandemic uh, preparedness uh, in influenza guide, or pan pandemic preparedness for the health sector uh, guide, they had identified, uh, following our H1N1 research, they identified that homeless people should be considered as part of vulnerable populations during pandemics. But we did not see the creation of pandemic plans in, in many cities, in many places. Thunder Bay is one of those places where there was no pandemic plan that included uh, homeless people as, as part of the special or vulnerable populations that needed um, that needed unique considerations. And so, uh, so during this pandemic, you know, we've seen a, a lot of challenges in terms of making sure that we can um, keep homeless people safe and not just homeless people, the staff who work with homeless people as well, who are at much higher risk of um, uh, contracting the virus. I know we were kibitzing a moment ago with Ron about whether his was a rogue shelter, but I guess I should put this on the record here because we did receive this statement from the Windsor-Essex County Health Unit. So, Sheldon, if we would, let's put this graphic up here and we'll read along. Since the declaration of the outbreak at the downtown mission of Windsor, the Windsor-Essex County Health Unit has worked closely with the mission leadership, health system partners, and the city of Windsor to stop the spread of COVID-19 and provide support for those seeking shelter. We work together and continue Continue to work together to resolve the COVID-19 outbreak and allow a safe reopening of the downtown mission. Ron, I guess I should give you a chance to comment on that. Is that how does that sound to you? Yeah, it's it's spot on. Um, you know, after we got through the 
whether I was rogue or not conversation. Um, we really pulled together. My team went actually, my staff went to run or, or co-run the city facility, uh, what you know we're calling it the aquatic center. Um, it, it did, we did pull together. And actually today we received the all clear from the health unit to reopen. So we're um, expecting our, our first uh, guest to arrive back around one o'clock today. So we're really excited about that. Good. Lorraine, um, here's the sort of tricky balancing act question that I've got to ask, which is how do you balance the need to shelter people who are experiencing homelessness, particularly at during the winter time and was a, a tough winter for a lot of people, while at the same time trying to protect them from outbreaks that they have probably a better chance of experiencing in a congregate care setting. How do you deal with all that? Yeah, it's definitely a tough balance. I thought that it was really interesting that um, there was this pandemic plan that was not in place. So I think how the Toronto government has been responding has been incredibly reactive. We had been talking to city officials in the spring, asking them, like, what is the plan for winter when there's going to be more people who need to come inside? We were seeing people in the community have to make a choice between staying in congregate settings or being outside where they know they could be safely isolated, um, but there was no access to even things like bathrooms, which we actually still don't have. And right now we're actually seeing COVID outbreaks in a whole bunch of hotel shelters across the city and the recovery hotel is actually nearing capacity. So people actually have no alternative spaces to go to isolate even when they get COVID. So now people with COVID in the shelter system are just remaining in these settings, which is a recipe for a disaster. Um, we know that homeless people are five times more likely to die from the virus and 20 more times 20 times more likely to have to access intensive care support. So there hasn't actually been any plan in place as spoken about earlier. And so I think what we're seeing is then a lot of people saying, no, like being inside these um, hotel shelter spaces are actually not safe for me. And so this is why we see a lot more people um, camping outside in public spaces. Because they think they can be safer under those circumstances from the virus. Is that it? Absolutely. I mean, government officials tell us, I mean, stay home to stay safe, but if you have no home, you can't do that. And then they tell you to socially distance and isolate where we know that's not possible in, in congregate hotel shelters, shelter settings. And so being outside is really like the, the safest option to abide by actual um, health and safety protocol. Hmm. Have you got a guess, Lorraine, at what percentage of the people that you deal with might have received a vaccination so far? Um, I think specifically in our community, I would say it's quite low because specifically in our community, um, not a lot of people are actually staying in the shelter system. So the shelter system is currently prioritized for vaccinations. And we know that there are, there are some people who are quite excited about it and other people who are needing more information before deciding to. Um, but there's a lot of people in the community I work with who ride transit overnight, who stay at subway stations, who are wandering out and about in the streets, and those communities are actually not being prioritized for the vaccine, and there's no plan in terms of what vaccination rollouts might look like at a drop-in center, for instance. And so I would say a large number of our community right now are not vaccinated. Hmm. Nadine, how about you? Uh, could you give us a sense about what percentage of the population you deal with has been vaccinated? He, um, here at the lot, like we have the vaccine rollout, like we have about 20 20 people so far that got vaccinated here. 20 out of better 10 city. 20 out of how 20 many? 20 out of 50. 20 out of 50. Okay, well, that's actually a better, that's a much higher percentage than the, than the province in general. I think, you know, it's mm -hmm. probably about 12 or 13% of the province that's been vaccinated so far. So you're doing better than most of the rest of the province. But do I, I mean, I, I'm guessing that you'd like to have everybody vaccinated as soon as possible because after all, they are, more inclined to get COVID-19 than the average member of the population. Is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And they're coming back today again to do another vaccination rollout, so. They are, how I many How many will you get done today? Maybe another 20. Another 20, Probably. okay. Yeah. Ron Dunn, how about with the folks you deal with? What percentage has been vaccinated? Yeah, so across the shelter system here, I believe that uh, they reported about 150, 160 vaccinations were done in the last week, week and a half. So um, given our population, um, we, we're really pleased with that number. I, I think that um, many that are in our population um, have trust issues. And, and so 
um, making that personal decision to get a vaccine was not easy for for many, myself included, to be honest. Um, you know, you got to weigh all those things. So, you know, I'm 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 really thrilled with the with the rollout plan. Our our health unit and our and the city of Windsor officials and those that were involved in it um, did a great job. Rebecca, the organizations that you and your organization deal with, what percentage of the folks do you think have been vaccinated? I couldn't say it across all of Northern Canada, but I could speak for Thunder Bay. Um, and in Thunder Bay, there has been quite a turnaround. I, I spoke before about how there were, wasn't a pandemic plan in place for uh, the homeless sector, but uh, that's really changed since the beginning of COVID-19. And so homeless, uh, the homeless population has been prioritized. So people experiencing homelessness or housing instability are prioritized to receive vaccinations. And so there are a lot of people that are getting vaccinated right now. Something else I should mention that seems a a little bit of the ele elephant in the room for me is that Indigenous people are vastly overrepresented in the homeless population in, in Canada and especially in, in Thunder Bay and other northern locations. And so Indigenous uh, Indigenous adults were also prioritized for COVID vaccinations, which has um, certainly uh, made an impact in the city as well. There is an understandable, given the colonial history between uh, settler culture and Indigenous people in this country, there is an understandable, um, well, what word do we want to use here? Fear, concern, lack of trust. Um, you know, when, when official medicine shows up to say, here, I've got a vaccine of something, take this. Have you noticed, uh, Rebecca, any vaccine hesitancy among Indigenous people? I think there's some vaccine hesitancy among people who are experiencing homelessness, but I can't say that it's necessarily because um, someone is Indigenous and has a mistrust of the government, or it, or it could be for, for other reasons. I, I just don't know. But I, it certainly could, could be a factor, and there's a lot of cause for mistrust of, of the government um, that, that's understandable among Indigenous people in Canada. Lorraine, how about you? Are you seeing any vaccine hesitancy? I would echo Rebecca, actually, that the hesitancy isn't simply just within the Indigenous community, but it's across the homelessness sector. Specifically in Toronto, though, Anishinaabe Health Toronto has been prioritizing vaccines for the Indigenous community. And um, a lot of people sort of see their peers and their elders in the community who are getting the vaccines. So there is some level of trust building there. I would say that colonialism... We are seeing that play out presently in the city's approach to encampments um, and how we have city staff coming in to basically displace a whole bunch of people uh, camping on the lands and forcing them elsewhere. And we're seeing people die when, they force, when they're forced to leave the encampments. What, what are the alternatives, though? I think at this point, we know that the hotel shelter options are not safe for people. And so actually, I think what we really need is a long-term plan for housing. Um, a lot of these hotel shelters in Toronto are only leased until 2021, like the end of the year. And as of right now, there's no plan for what happens after. So where where are all these people in the hotel shelters supposed to go? Um, and furthermore, like a lot of people who are outside are simply just waiting for housing. The housing list right now for subsidized housing, it's about 10 years for a bachelor apartment and 12 years for a one-bedroom apartment. And so people are literally just waiting for an opportunity because there are so many people on the housing list. So I think that actually the solution to encampments and these hotel shelters and, and all of this stuff is actually prioritizing the building of affordable housing um, and making housing actually affordable for the larger population. Well, we've got a clip that speaks to this, so let's play that now, because uh, the deputy mayor, one of the deputy mayors for Toronto is Michael Thompson, and we had him on this program about a month ago, brought up the issue of these encampments in general, and one carpenter in particular who was building little homes for people experiencing homelessness. Let's have a look at that. Sheldon, if you would. We want to actually remove people from the street and the encampment and put them in places where they're safe and they're well housed and they're warm. That is our effort with respect to trying to deal with this particular problem. We're investing a tremendous amount of resources. We're putting a lot of staff time and we're actually being quite successful in terms of removing. We've removed a significant number of people from the encampment. And I think it's important for us to ensure that we provide a safe environment for all those who are in need. So when we see situation in which it is unsafe, we cannot endorse and we cannot support. Lorraine, how does that sound to you? I have to strongly disagree with that statement. Um, moving people into hotel shelters is not actually safe. 
um, the city talks a lot about fire safety. And actually, I know personally somebody who died in a hotel fire um, just over New Year's Day. There was another fire shortly after that in a different hotel. And somebody I know who is uh, requiring a wheelchair was not able to leave her room while the fire was happening. And so she was trapped inside the space. So I would say that safety as the reason to clear encampments is not an adequate reason at all. Um, it's all, again, like we're in the middle of a pandemic and the outbreaks in hotel shelters have been awful. So moving people into these outbreak spaces is actually not the safest option. I would say that also a lot of people who have moved into these shelter hotel spaces have left because of a bunch of various reasons. So clearing encampments is actually just displacing people to other parks and it actually directly contradicts what CDC says is safe health and safety protocols. The CDC clearly says that dismantling encampments is not appropriate during the pandemic, and yet the city is moving forward on it anyway. Hmm. Rebecca, can I ask you about the kinds of encampments that people are accustomed to seeing in the bigger cities? Are you seeing those in the north? We don't see, I would say, the large encampments that you see in, in Thunder Bay or, or Vancouver or some of the other places, the, the tent cities that um, that we know exist in those large cities. People do often um, set up camps and probably smaller camps. So you might have a group of 10 people or maybe just one person who, who sets up camp, but they're much less visible, I think, than they are in, in the big cities because smaller cities, places in the north like Thunder Bay, they're so close to rural areas that people, if they, if they want to camp, if if they want to be away from the shelters and and the city and have their own space, it's it's much easier to escape into into the wild and and set up camp there. Gotcha. We've got just a few minutes left here, and I'd love to get just some ideas from all of you as to uh, what might be done to improve the situation. Nadine, if you had the ear of the Premier of Ontario right now, what would you tell him you need? I would tell him that uh, that we need more tiny homes. <laughs> I everywhere in tiny homes everywhere for um homeless people instead of putting them in hotels i think tiny homes is the way to go how much do they cost each i think they cost about five thousand dollars to to bill for everything all the work so you can get them up quick and dirty and they do the job yeah that's right <laughs> okay there's a pitch for uh tiny homes for more tiny homes across ontario ron dunn what if you had the premier's ear what would you tell him well, I'd, I'd invite him, as I have done multiple times, down for a tour of Windsor-Essex. I, I think, you know, if you're going to make decisions about um, geog geographical regions, you, you need to have seen it firsthand. Um, but, you know, affordable housing. How do you, end ho how do you end homelessness? You provide housing that is affordable and sustainable. Our community has not had a um, sustainable or an investment in affordable housing in almost 35 years. Until recently, their, their shovel is in the ground. But it's... Um, Maybe too little, too late. Based on based on everything that we know, in 2018 we had 168 families experiencing chronic homelessness. In 2019 we had 342. We're going in the wrong direction. We need strong government mandate to our municipalities from all levels of government to get involved, and that's going to require funding. And I hate to make everything about funding always, but you you can't build a tent city or you can't do any of those things with um, without money. And I'll just say I'm not. I've never advocated for tents. This is Canada. A basic living, you know, human right is a home. So I think while a tent is a, you know, maybe a short-term alternative, definitely not something that we endorse here at the Downtown Mission. Rebecca, advice for the Ontario government? Steve, I'll, I'll pick up a bit on the financial accountability officer's report because I, I do agree with um, what he was saying about the fact that we need more support. There isn't enough being done right now. And so um, certainly we need more funding for affordable housing, but we really need more support for rural and remote communities and also for the small cities that serve large rural areas. So cities like Thunder Bay, Sudbury, uh, Kenora, Sioux Lookout that serve uh, quite large homeless populations and, and need more support uh, for the services that they can provide. Lorraine, I know we just had a budget in the province of Ontario, so we know what's in that. We don't know yet what's in the federal budget, which is coming out the third week of April. You want to offer some advice to the feds? Um, I would echo that tents are last resorts and people really need housing. Um, and so right now, people who are trying to get out of the tents um, are not able to get housing. So we need, actually need affordable housing. I would say that the country has determined that an appropriate level to survive on every month is $2,000 on CERB. But meanwhile, social assistance rates are much below that. 
um, Ontario Welfare, you get $350 for basic needs and a top up of $397 for rent supplement. That totals your check to just $700. How is it that we keep people who are on social assistance on that kind of income when the country has determined that people actually need at least $2,000 to live? Um, I think that is a big gap in terms of how policy is failing. And I think the tents and encampments are a visible symptom of all the failures that are that we're seeing. And a quick follow-up, Lorraine. Do you think the decision makers understand that all of these issues that we've been talking about, not just homelessness per se, but all of the issues that spring from that, do, do they understand the interconnectedness of all those issues? I don't think they do. I would agree that um, they need to actually come and see it in person. Not one councillor really has shown up to one of the encampments to take a look around to see what's happening, maybe once or twice. You know, I think during this pandemic, we've heard politicians say, we are all in this together. But I think what's actually unsaid is, we are all in this together unless you're poor, unless you're poor, then good luck. Well, we hope some of them are listening. And we're grateful to all of you for joining us on TVO tonight to help us better understand this issue. Rebecca Schiff in Thunder Bay, Ontario. Reverend Ron Dunn in Windsor, Ontario. Nadine Green in Kitchener, Ontario. And Lorraine Lamb in the downtown of the provincial capital. Good wishes to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. And that is the agenda for Thursday, March the 25th, 2021. In recent months, a spate of anti-Asian violence on both sides of the border has put a spotlight on such hate crimes. Tomorrow, Nam Kiwanuka looks into what's happening here and the psychology behind race-based attacks. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org. And Nam, we'll see you here tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Looking for more of TVO's in-depth current affairs and documentaries? Visit tvo.org slash daily and sign up for our daily newsletter with links to agenda interviews, Steve Pakin's blogs, and preview our upcoming documentaries. That's all at tvo.org slash daily.